So today we're going to start with modeling periodic phenomenon. And the best example of this is just imagine uh, Earth, you know, spinning around the sun and repeating itself that motion over and over and over again. That's what we're going to start talking about. Now, there are actually many examples of repeating patterns in the world, either naturally occurring or engineered. So motion that is repeated over time, it's called periodic, oscillatory, or cyclic. And this is what we're talking about. So imagine pulling a pendulum over to the side and letting it go, and it would just go back and forth and back and forth and repeat itself. This is the type of situation we can model. So we're going to write an equation or a model basically to describe the position of this, I guess in this case, this pendulum, as a function of or versus time. These are the two, the two values or the two variables we're going to link together. We link two variables together all the time. You know, think of, you know, y equals mx plus b. You know, we have the y and the x. Those were our two variables that we linked together. And we had, you know, the m and the b just told us information about that specific case. So we've done this before. This is just obviously a little more of a complicated version of it. And to do it, we're actually going to use some properties from trigonometry to write this model properly. So it could be a pendulum swinging back and forth, that's repeated motion. It could be a spring moving up and down, that's repeated motion. It could be something moving in a circle, that's repeated motion. And we're probably going to use the circle example uh, more often than not. It's a nice example for us to think about. So just like something, um, there's a basic model we're going to be able to write. There's going to, we're going to have a need for some manipulations or some transformations. So for example, we could have a, this, the red ball here moving back and forth. It's kind of slowly or the yellow or the green, or we could have, you know, the blue ball moving back and forth very quickly. So we need to be able to manipulate these and use transformations to write different kinds of models. Simple example of that is, you know, we have the moon around the earth or you have um, Jupiter that has, I think like, I think like 11 moons, but the, the three, one, three main ones I think we can see with binoculars, Io, uh, Europa, and Ganymede. Um, different moons would spin around at different speeds, so we would need a slightly different uh, transformed model for each one. Uh, in terms of machinery, hydraulics. Okay, there's some periodic functions with hydraulics that repeat themselves over time. So hydraulics that assist basically all, all heavy machinery. Any moving engine part repeats itself. So this, this rotates over and over and over again, and we could model that. Um, pistons in a car engine. So this would be, you know, four pistons. You know, this would be uh, eight, you know, eight pistons moving up and down. We could model this using trigonometry. But I think the best example for us is going to be the Ferris wheel because I think it's, it's probably tricky. It's, it's difficult for people to really wrap their head around. I mean, you know cars, obviously, but you don't know, you know, the workings of an internal combustion engine that well. But everyone's probably been on a Ferris wheel or, or, or seen a Ferris wheel or whatever. So I think it's a pretty familiar experience for everyone. And you can imagine you're hopping on a car at the bottom and then you just, you just basically move around the wheel. And what we're going to do is, how we're going to actually tackle this is with, is with time. So we'd have time down here and we would have your height above the ground. And this would be the function. Imagine, here's your, here's your uh, car here. Suppose you jump on somewhere. Get my hands right here. Suppose you jump on here, and as you're moving up, this is your height above the ground. Okay, it's moving up your height, and then you get to a maximum, and then, of course, your height begins to decrease. And then you get down to the bottom. And then oh, a little fast there, and then it repeats again. So your height goes up, and you, and and so on. You get a sense of how we can sort of link these things together. So as with any topic of complexity, there's going to be two sides. There's going to be mechanics, and there's going to be the applications. So we're going to start with the mechanics. And again, there are you know there are six trig ratios we've talked about: sine, cos, tan, cosecant, and so on. But we're just going to deal with a couple of them. Just really sine and cos are the only two we're really going to use. So I thought, okay, let's just start with the, with the sine function. So that's where we're going to start. And we're just going to tackle the structure of it, and we're going to talk about some of the basic transformations on it. So just to simplify things, this is going to be the basic sine function. So you can imagine, here's our unit circle, the great thing of having a radius of 1. We're going to talk about the height of this purple object above the x-axis, or the ground. 
So as this thing right spins around, the purple object is sitting here. Radius of one, here's my theta. I can write this simple using Sakatoa, sine theta is h over one. And again, the beauty of dividing by one is we can just drop it out because it doesn't mean anything really. So we have h equals sine theta, and this is this, this basic function. This is actually, I don't wanna go through, through this too quickly. This is actually really important. So what we're saying is that the height, so the height above the ground of this object from here, the ground, the x-axis, that height, that h, h, is related to, or is a function, really, of theta, or sine theta, but really it's theta. And you can see how that makes sense. If, if this purple line was my initial arm, and this black pen was the height, as this, as this begins to spin, see how the height gets bigger and bigger, the black pen gets bigger, and then as, it, as theta decreases, the black pen gets lower down. So as theta is getting bigger, the height gets bigger, and then as theta gets lower, the height decreases. So this height, this, no, the height of the black pen, I guess, or this h, is related to theta, it's related to the opening. So I'm trying to get this, this gap, basically. As this opens, you know, the gap gets bigger and bigger, and, and so on. That's how we're relating these two things together. That's important. And obviously, you can even see from this, as it gets bigger and bigger, okay, the height's getting bigger. There's actually gonna be a maximum height, at 90 degrees, right? They're gonna actually be the same. And then as this keeps the, keeps spinning, the height's gonna get lower and lower. Okay, and then theory, you know, as it keeps going, the height's gonna be negative. So it goes over, the height's now negative like that. And then it spins and it's kind of hard to see, but that's that's the idea. So that's a key, a key point. That this, this distance we're talking about is a function of theta. So imagine, suppose we spun theta all the way over to there, whatever. That was our big opening, our theta. This would be what we're talking about, that height. Or suppose we spun theta all the way down to there. And this is huge opening theta. It's okay. That would be the, the thing we're talking about, that height. And so on. I mean, we could, we could, you know, again, you could spin theta, and we will, you know, a million times. And then, you know, wherever it stops, we always shoot back to the x-axis. And that's the thing we're looking at. So that's, that's what we're trying to relate to. We're trying to relate height and theta, which is interesting because actually <laughs> it goes all the way back to, even remember our very initial trig question was, you know, what's the height of a tree when we can't go up and actually climb a tree? So this, it's interesting how this height value, this height topic um, keeps popping up with trig. So for us, notation-wise, um, we're going to leave theta, we can, and we can use x or theta, but we're going to change h to y just because it's the y-axis, it's Cartesian plane, but it's meaning the same thing. We're not, this isn't new, we're not trying to confuse anything. It's really h, it's really the, the height of this value, but we're gonna use for notation just the y um, variable. So this is our function, basically y equals sine theta. That's our basic function, trigonometric function we're gonna tackle. So how do we draw, you know, something moving in a circle on a graph? We can't just draw a plane and, and just draw a circle a million times, so we need a better way to do this. And we've seen this idea before where we draw a right triangle within the circle and we, and we deal with this upper corner. That's what we're talking about. So here's a task I want you to do. So I want you to just pause the video in a second and, and take 10 minutes. You're gonna draw a graph and I want the domain to be from zero over 450 degrees and I want the range to be from negative one up to positive one. And we're gonna use common angles and we're gonna draw the sine function and you're gonna use your calculator. So I drew an example of this, and I think if I hold it there, I don't know if you can see it. Um, looks like it's okay. So let me just do this, put this behind here. Hopefully it's light enough. Yeah, okay. And just hold it. Right there, okay, looks pretty good. So I want the, the uh, y-axis, I'm going up by 0.1, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, all the up to one. And then I'm going negative 0.1, negative 0.2, negative 0.3, all the way down to negative one. And then the angles I'm using, there's 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, and so on. I'm going by 30 degree increments across. So I want you to, to build that. I'll put a picture of this up on our, our feed as well. Okay, I want you to build this. Then what I want you to do is you're gonna plot these points. So you're gonna use different angles. You're gonna start with 30. Maybe you can see the calculator here. Let me turn it on. And make sure I'm in, yeah, so with the calculator, let me see that. Make sure you're in uh, degrees. I am in radians, which you don't want, so check your calculator. I'm going to make sure I'm in, here we are, radians over here, degrees. Okay, 
And then I'm just gonna start cranking through this. So I'm gonna go sine of zero. And sine zero, I hit enter, and that gives me my value. And then I'm gonna go sine of 30 equals. And then I'm gonna go sine of 60 equals. And just keep working my way through. So I'm gonna have these angles, and I'm gonna have these decimal numbers kicked out. So on my grid, I'm gonna have, you know, sine of zero over there, sine 30, so that's my 30 degrees. So 30 degrees, whatever my decimal number was, I'll plot it. My 60 degrees, whatever my decimal number, I plot it. My 90 degrees, whatever my decimal number is, I plot it, and so on. And you keep going, I want you to move all your way through this down to 450. And you're gonna do it for, let me see it's here. You're gonna do it for y equals sine theta, and I want you to do it for y equals cos theta. Use the same plane. I want you to do it for both of those. Okay, take a few minutes, graph it, and see what you get, and hopefully you think it's interesting. Okay, so uh, hopefully you're back and you saw that what it creates is actually a wave, which is actually kind of cool. So this is how, this is an important part here, this is how we're actually going from a circle to this two-dimensional, essentially this projection or this graph of, of the height. So this is, what we're talking about here is the height of this circle above the x-axis as a function of time. So we see that it's, it's heading up to the top it's dropping off here, it's now negative down there, and it's there. So the height is increasing, it's the height we're looking at. Maximum height goes back to zero. The height now is a minimum height, and it goes back to zero. And it's important to see that why this is curved. This is not a straight line, okay? The function, it doesn't go like this. It doesn't go straight, and then straight, and then straight, and then straight, well, straight, and so on. It's curved, it's actually, it's a curved line, it's like this. It's because, okay, your height is actually, it's an acceleration and a decelerate, you're speeding up and slowing down. The height itself above the ground, the rate of change of the height is changing. It's speeding up and slowing down. It's not a constant um, increase or decrease, which is really weird to see because your speed is constant. So as you rotate, you know, the, imagine you're on the Ferris wheel, your speed is actually the same circular, or it's called an angular velocity, it's the same velocity you're moving in a circle, but the measurement of your height above the ground, you're actually speeding up. And at this point, you have this maximum speed and you're slowing down. You can imagine, right? Imagine being on a Ferris wheel and you know, you're going towards the top. When you're near the top of a Ferris wheel, your height isn't changing much. You're kind of at the top, you, can, you, know, you can see a long way away and so on. There's not a lot going on. And then the Ferris wheel, as it spins around, right, you sort of get that feeling where it's the maximum velocity right at the edge. And then it begins to slow down again vertically you know, once you're near the bottom of it, you're kind of, you're kind of near the bottom of it and you don't really feel a lot of the, the vertical change. And then you, you kind of feel it vertically, it speeds up a little bit. So it's kind of hard to see, think about. It's a, it's a constant angular velocity, but in terms of your vertical displacement, it's, it's actually changing. The rate of change is actually not consistent. That's why it's curved. Okay, it's important to realize. So when you draw these graphs, it's not a straight line. It's not straight up, straight up, straight up. It's actually curved. It's actually going pretty quickly and then your, your vertical displacement slows down and your vertical displacement speeds up and it curves. Now, again, it's a curve because you're accelerating towards and away from a fixed object. It's not a straight line, okay? It's important for us to, to realize. And you probably saw that when you graphed it. Okay, same idea here that your distance, you know, your distance from here to here is a pretty big jump and then the distance gets, separation-wise vertically gets smaller. It's only a, a tiny jump vertically from here to here. So that's why it gets sort of this curved line gets created. Don't worry about these units, these are radians. Don't worry about those, we're in, we're in degrees, that's okay. So these two basic models can be used for all periodic modeling. Okay, so we have y equals sine theta, which starts here, and we have y equals cos theta, which starts up there. And these two essentially theoretical waves can be used to represent anything that, any wave motion or periodic motion or, or circular motion. It's pretty amazing, really, when you think about it. <laughs> Another idea here where we have these pistons, we have the blue one going up and down pretty quickly, there's the blue one, and the green one and the black one. So different, you know, different speeds of going up and down will create, you know, different versions of our wave functions. So just some basic components of these things so we can we can understand. Okay, we're gonna have this midline. So the middle of the function 
is going to be the midline. Okay, so with our theoretical version, okay, our midline is obviously the x-axis and it goes up and down like that and so on. You know, with a Ferris wheel example, your midline can't be on the x-axis or else, you know, huh, it'd be kind of interesting, but the Ferris wheel would have to actually plow through the ground and then you're up in the air and the Ferris wheel plows through the ground again. That's not the case. So we actually have this, obviously, this vertical displacement. We have the transformation. Uh, the function is moved up vertically just so you're safe. You're not, you know, hitting the ground on your Ferris wheel. So that's called the midline. Okay, we have the period, which is just the length from one spot to when we get back over to another spot, the same spot. So this is like number one here. So at one. So I'm at one here. And it spins up and spins down and back at a height of one. Okay, if, if it, I started at two seconds and it ended up at six seconds, the period would be four seconds. So it's the length of time it takes to get back to the same spot. It'd be the same if I did peak to peak. I could go peak to peak there. That would also be four seconds. The amplitude is the distance from the midline to the peak. That's called the amplitude of our equation, our function. Okay, good. Hopefully that uh, that's makes some sense. And then try some a few questions on page two ninety, and then move on to the next the next lesson.